All right, so hello and welcome to new international student orientation. Um, my name is Kelsey. I'm an international student advisor here. Akane, who checked you in, is also an international student advisor here, and she's also the director of international student services. We have Calvin and Dwayne sitting up here, and they're going to join us later in the presentation to give you guys some good tips. Um, Niaz is hosting our um, Zoom room. He is a student employee with our office. And we're also going to have another student employee joining us later to give a tour. And we have Vanessa creeping in the back. She's our interim executive director of Office of Global Affairs. So this is the team and we'll be giving you the presentation today. So we'll go through the agenda first. These are rough estimates. Um, they're basically guesses. We're going to hopefully be here from 1 to 3.30. Afterwards, we have pizza and an optional ca campus tour, which will be led from our student staff. Um, so we'll start with welcome and introductions so you guys have a chance to meet each other and get to know each other. Um, then we'll get into the bulk of the presentation. It's built into three main parts. We're not going to waste a lot of time talking about your visa, although it's really important. That information is available in the IESS portal, and we have a required form that you need to fill out about your visa. So we'll leave the boring stuff online. We're going to talk about academic culture, um, cultural awareness, so coming to a new culture, because you all are from a different country and in a new culture. So hopefully we can give you a framework to adjust. And finally, we'll go over some important campus resources. Okay, so learning objectives. First and foremost, we want you guys to meet each other, get to know each other, get to know us in International Student Services, and also meet a couple campus partners as well. Um, we want to talk about academic expectations because they might be very different from your home country. So we wanna prepare you for what those differences might look like. Um, cultural awareness and humility. We want to give you a framework to approach coming to a new culture, and it's going to be an interactive session, so hopefully it should be fun. And learning about campus resources as well, so you know what offices to take advantage of and how to get all of your benefits as students. Okay, so we are going to start with a land acknowledgement. This might be a little bit new for some of you, but this is pretty common at UW Tacoma. We just wanna take a moment and acknowledge that this institution is on land that belonged to the Native American people. And so before major presentations, you might see this, and it's just a moment to reflect and acknowledge that. So we recognize that all of us at UW Tacoma learn, live, and work on or near the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people. In particular, we are situated on the territory of the Puyallup. As people of this occupied territory, we have a responsibility to acknowledge the land, the ancestors who have cared for this land since time immemorial, and all our indigenous connections today. We also have the responsibility to acknowledge the histories of dispossession and forced removal that have allowed for the growth and survival of this institution. In light of this history, let us take active efforts to partner with our indigenous community members and neighbors as we continue to work together as a community of learners, leaders, and educators. Okay, so let's go into our first activity. It's just to meet each other, so we might have to break into some groups over there. Um, I'd like you to just introduce yourself by your preferred name and your preferred pronouns. Um, pronouns are often used here at UW Tacoma a lot. It's just a way to tell someone how you want to be referred to. So for example, if Akane is talking about me, I prefer that she use the pronouns she, her. So I would say, my name is Kelsey and my pronouns are she, her. Um, you can tell us where you're joining UW Tacoma from. Maybe you are coming from a different institution in the US or maybe you are fresh off the plane from somewhere else. So just let us know where you're coming from, what you're planning to study. And then lastly, what is your favorite hobby or activity when you're not studying? <laughs> Um, so we'll take about five minutes and maybe we'll make groups of like four back here and we'll join you guys to talk as well. All right, thank you. Um, Niaz, can you hear me pretty well? All clear. Excellent. How you doing? Um, okay, and I'll stay close to the mic so that we actually still get content coming in. Um, hey everybody, my name is Dwayne Chambers. I and myself and Kelvin are TLC employees. 
Um, and the TLC is the Teach and Learn Center, so it's a tutoring center on campus. And so I'm going to be talking to you a fair bit about academic culture at UW Tacoma. Um, and I'm going to wear a few hats during my talk. So I'm going to talk to you first as a member of the TLC, so somebody who is actually looking to support you. I'm going to also talk to you a little bit as an instructor. So I teach here at UW Tacoma. I teach in the mathematics department. I teach pre-calculus and calculus um, and some of the numbers courses that you may have forgotten. Um, but I'm also an international, so I'll be wearing that hat as well. So I came to the US as an international student from Jamaica. Um, and there's just a lot for me to adopt, adapt to. There's still a lot for me to adapt to. Um, I know that there are some of you who are recent here to the States, and then some of you have been here for eight or 10 years. Um, but there's always some steps for adapting for every new environment that you find. So um, let's get right into it. So academic culture at UW Tacoma. So let's talk a little bit first about your classes. So your expectations from classes. This is interesting. Hold on. Oh, cool. Or this thing? Oh, but now I can't see their expressions. Okay. Um, okay, so expectations for classes and for your coursework. So um, you guys are all excellent students. So make sure when you actually get your classes start tomorrow. So this is this hopefully is very pertinent, just in time information. Um, make sure to prepare for your classes. Um, most of you are doing a graduate program or a graduate level course. So make sure to read all your assigned readings before class. Uh, make sure to cite your sources. Um, make sure you actually know exactly what the line is in terms of citing and not citing um, or not citing enough. Um, and then participate in class. So your teacher's role, um, I'll give you a, a bit of a comparison. Um, in Jamaica, when my teacher teaches, my role as a student is typically to, to sort of sit and listen very similar to what you're doing right now. So I'm giving you information and then you are, are passively receiving that information. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different at UW Tacoma. It's gonna be a, different, a little bit different in the US in general. Um, so your teacher's goal is to teach, yes, but it's also to facilitate by pulling from you your opinions and creating an environment where we're all sharing information together. Um, so definitely arrive on time. Um, and on time in the US usually means like a few minutes early. Uh, on time in Jamaica, it means like 30 minutes late. So if you understand that kind of culture, um, go for the US version of on time. Um, share, make sure your, your faculty will expect you to share your opinions. Um, so learn to create inside yourself an opinion, which is really hard. Like you're learning a lot of this material for the first time and you're like, how can I have an opinion? Just kind of go with your gut at some point in time. Also, because you've done the reading ahead of time, you should have some sort of thoughts or inklings. So share your opinions. Your classes, as I said, will be interactive. And then there is, maybe not in the MSBA program, but in a number of the classes that you do take, there will be a component, which is participation. So your teacher will also grade you on how much you're actually engaging in the classroom. So um, just be aware of that. Um, okay, talking as a professor. So our role is to present ideas, um, to gather our information. Um, a lot of professors are informal. So when I started college, I had a professor, Professor Lynn Moulter. Um, she's okay with me using her name. Um, and from the very start of my college career, she said, call me Lynn. And I was like, sure, Professor Moulter. And she's like, yeah, you can really call me Lynn. That's okay, Professor, sure. Um, and it's not that I didn't want to call her Lynn. It's just in, in my culture, because she's a professor, I just could not not have the word professor, nor could I actually just use somebody's first name. Um, as you adapt to US culture, do as much as you can. I mean, still make sure that you show respect in a way that feels in, intuitive and genuine to you. Um, but if you are, you are able to go as far as calling her lit, call her lit if you can, if she asks you to do. Um, but also still, I think, maintain some amount of respect. Um, also a big deal for your instructors is office hours. So does everybody here know what office hours are? Raise your hands if you know what office hours are. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not preaching to the choir. Okay, so your instructor is actually obligated to create a space, an hour, maybe more than an hour actually, each week to meet with you. Um, 
So you can meet with your professor if you have questions about an assignment, if you have questions about reading, or if you can meet with your professor, even if you just wanna actually have a little bit more information about what you're working on. Um, so if you're working on something like Tableau and you're saying to yourself, this is my first time using an application like Tableau. If in class, it feels like there's not enough information and from the reading, use your professor's office hours. Flip side, let's suppose that you actually feel like you are a Tableau master. Tableau is a statistics software. You'll find out about it more very soon in your, in your class. If, even if you feel like you're a master and you're like acing your classes, at some point in time, stop by your professor's office hours. Um, one of the things that your professors will function as is they will be references for you in the future. And so when I write a reference for my students, when I write a recommendation for my students for whatever job that they're applying, it helps that they got good grades. Yes, I can look at my grade book and it's like, oh, excellent, that student was excellent. But if I know a little bit about that student's personality, I can write an even better letter. And the way that your professor will recognize your personality is through class, yes, but in office hours, you get a chance for your professor to actually get to know who you are just a little bit deeper. Um, so use your off, use office hours um, at some point in time each of the semesters. Um, let's see. And then communicate. So your professors are really understanding students. And I'm actually, they're not students, really understanding people. Um, and I'm actually speaking from experience in the MSBA program. If there's anything that happened in life where you feel like I fell behind on this assignment or I need an extension or I need this or need that, um, my typical instinct is to think this is on me. This is my responsibility. I'll figure it out myself or I'll take the, you know, I'll take the D, I'll take the, fa the fail. One of the really nice things about our culture is because our classes are not so humongous as humongous as maybe UW Seattle or whatever, you can contact your professor directly and your professor will actually be able to respond to you on an individual basis. So if you said like, hey, I got sick and I fell behind on this assignment, reach out to your professor, especially you can reach out to your professor early um, and don't be surprised if your professor is like, that's, cool. that's okay. Let's see if we can extend, extend the assignment for you or let's see if I can help you in some way. Um, so yeah. Expect compassion, or at least don't be surprised that your professor actually wants to know how you are doing individually. So, um, Grace has entered the waiting room. Oh, sure. Welcome, Grace. Oh, uh, very fast, Nia's. And there are 10 chats, but Nia's has the chats under control. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so curious what's in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that is you as you in interact with your instructor. Um, also interact with your peers. So these are some of your peers. Um, so welcome. Um, as we mentioned in, in earlier, um, you know, learn people's pronouns, uh, but also take a little bit of time to learn how to pronounce your, your classmates and your future friends, um, how to pronounce their names. Um, eye contact is really interesting. Um, in my country, we do not make steady eye contact. If we make steady eye contact, it's because we want to fight, all right? Um, but, but in the US, good eye contact, firm eye contact, usually indicates that you're actually being honest. Um, so if it's not normal, if it's not natural to you, just practice a little bit, like look in the mirror and be like, yeah, <laughs> okay, okay, don't, don't do that. But I definitely just practice recognizing that in the US, making eye contact, really says that I'm not hiding anything and I'm being as genuine as possible. So eye contact is a great thing. Um, obviously, personal space in the era of COVID is a great thing as well. So um, you want to give people that six foot distance. Um, we've already practiced that. Um, be prepared for the Seattle freeze. Um, a number of you have actually been around the US and around the world. Um, the Seattle freeze is not unique to Seattle, um, but it is this phenomenon, I guess, where People may be nice, but you've not, how do I put this? Calvin, do you have a way, for, a way to explain this? Um, let's see, uh, not entirely genuine. Yeah, um, so polite, but you've not entered the friendship circle. Um, and so 
be prepared for that. Um, also be prepared to, to make friends, to work on having small talk, uh, which is a, a big thing in the US. If you're looking for small talk conversations, the weather is really good. Um, you know, we are in the Northwest, so the weather is nice during the summer and then it rains the rest of the year. Um, so you can always talk about the latest rain. <laughs> um, so that's a good thing to talk about. Um, so just practice small talk. Um, you'll find a lot of people will be friendly and just practice that as well. Um, and then expect that alcohol will be a part of college culture. I don't think many of you are living in the dorms, but um, for college events, no, that's not true. Um, you will not find alcohol at official college events, but whether in the dorms or whether for unofficial events, um, expect that there'll be alcohol. Um, but do take sexual harassment very important. Um, that has no place in our college. Um, and there is, we'll have some information about how to report that, um, but take that very seriously, so. Um, am I going too fast? Does anybody have any questions or does anybody have comments? All right, I will keep going. And since you didn't have questions, I'm gonna just ask you questions. So we're gonna play a game. All right, so this is a game and it's called the American Phrasebook. And so what's happening is that as, oh, I'm too far from the microphone. Um, as you've actually adapted or as you are adapting to your new culture here in the US, um, we need to understand more than what is just being said academically. So, you know, you understand the academic in English, but you want to understand what is the real meaning behind this. So let's just start you off with a, and so you are going to participate in this. This is where you get your participation points, okay? So those of you who really like your A's, get ready. All right, so let's suppose that you have made it onto campus, which you have, and you are making friends. And, you know, as you are walking down, you know, Gillen Wall, Gillen Wall or Plaza or something like that, you see one of your potential friends and they're like, hey, how are you? How's it going? What's up? What do they really mean when they say that? What is, what? hi, hello. Okay, cool. Yes. So oftentimes, hey, what's up? What's going on? Really just means hello. It might not be a question. So you might realize that the person that they're saying, hey, how's it going? has not slowed down their walking pace. They're, they're actually not presented to actually make a conversation. So, all right, good job. You guys are on your way to an A. Okay. Okay, so you're having a conversation and the person, this is the Northwest, says, let's have coffee. Let's have coffee sometime. Let's hang out. Let's have lunch. What's, what's the person's real meaning here? What are we thinking? We'll meet again. Okay, that's an idea. Nice, kind of like. Oh, nice. I actually think that's exactly what it is. But you also had an opinion as well. <laughs> yes, that also is a great way to end a conversation. Yeah, really, what it means is like, hey, you're cool. Um, so when they say like, hey, let's have coffee, let's have lunch. Don't pull out your date book and be like, oh, okay, well, I am free on Tuesday. Um, Thursdays are not really good for me. Like, it's, it's a great way to end a conversation. Like, hey, great, great, great time of conversation. Um, let's hang out sometime. Goodbye. <laughs> like, okay. Um, okay. So maybe you're the one that says like, hey, let's have some coffee sometime or let's, let's hang out sometime. And they say, oh, I'll have to think about it. Um, what am I saying? <laughs> the, o, the O makes it a different sentence. The, the O makes it a different sentence, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on, don't, don't add the O. So you've suggested something and the person says, I'll have to think about it. What do they, what do they mean? Oh, that's excellently said, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll have to think about it really means I thought about it and the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, will you marry me? Yeah, I'll have to think about it. Like, no. Um, okay, you guys are doing really well. Okay, cool. So we are, let's have coffee. We're gonna meet at Metro, which is the campus coffee place, which I recommend. And the person says, sounds great. What does that mean? Okay, you guys are ready. Okay, yes, it means it's fine. Okay. 
Um, I have offered you some of my Jamaican um, specialty drink. Um, it's made from goats. And I've you know, had you taste something and you've tasted a little bit and you're like, oh, it's, it's not bad. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, yes, it, it's, not, it's not bad. Um, so we actually have a host daughter who's from Japan and I've actually learned to read some of the stuff. So, you know, we will offer something to her and she'll take a bite and say, it's not bad, okay. And you realize like this person is not about to take a second bite. So that it's not bad means that it, it actually is bad um, or I'm not interested in finding out more. Okay, um, as your instructor, I, I have read your work um, and I've, I've seen what you've done. And I said, you know, you might wanna consider um, adding this, this, or something like that. What do I mean when I say you might want to consider? <laughs> Excellent. It means you should do. Um, and if I say you would want to do, you would want to actually make these citations in MLA. What do I mean? <laughs> Go ahead and do it right now. All right. And then I can... Wait, I think the, the overall lesson here <laughs> is that Americans are not as direct as we like to think that we are. Mm. And we often think of ourselves that way, and we'll say to other people, oh, we're very direct. But as you can see, that is not necessarily the case. And actually, I think there's one more here, but I can't really see it. How did I get this? Hold on. Let's move this up. OK. This one is probably the most controversial one. <laughs> that's interesting. What do I mean when I say that's interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Tone matters for that one. Oh, a lot. I mean, it does for all of these, but. Yes. So that's interesting. Can mean that it's not interesting. Um, it can also mean um, that, you know, I, I just don't know what to say. <laughs> so I'm like, that, that's interesting. It could actually, you know, true confession. I've actually used this when I actually didn't hear the person. Like I'm having a conversation and they said to me, like, oh, that's interesting. And I really just did not hear. And I didn't want to say like, I didn't hear you or I didn't want to repeat. Um, but that's interesting could also mean that that's really interesting. Like if you see the person's eyebrows like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Right? That, that might mean that they want you to tell them more. Um, if they're talking about something that they just tasted, that's interesting means that that's not good. Uh, that's, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay. Good job. You guys are ready. You guys have all passed. You've done well with your um, with your participation. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you just a couple of rapid fire um, pieces of advice, nuggets of advice as you embark on this part of your U.S. journey. Um, so as you're adjusting to U.S. academic culture, um, one of the first pieces of advice I want to give you is be patient. Um, so you are writing a story. Um, this is a particular chapter in your life. Um, and for those of you who read books, everything doesn't happen on the first page. It doesn't happen in the first two pages. So be patient. Expect that this is going to be an interesting story that will have downs and also have ups. Um, and so don't expect for every setback for the, that to be the end or for every great thing that happens for it to be coasted and complete at the top. So remember your personal goals. So Keep in the forefront and in the back of your mind, why, are, why am I studying here? Why, am, why did I choose this? Um, and that will actually help you move through times where maybe the assignments are a bit heavier than you expected, um, or maybe you're up a little bit later than you wanted. Remember your bigger picture, which is why, why did I choose this? What, what was my goal? What was my family's goal as we went on this? Um, see the adventure in your experience. Um, that, that's connected to those first two as well. Like, just expect that this is a very exciting chapter that you're going to write, that it's going to be riveted when somebody reads it. Um, so see the adventure. Use your sense of humor. Um, one of the things that I've actually, <clears throat> that I've realized as an international is for a lot of things that I have to do in the U.S. So at one point, I had to go get a driver's license. At one point, I had to get a social security card or whatever. And I'm not very good at, like, paperwork things, like, just following, like, filling out stuff. And so it took me a couple tries to get these, get all the papers together. And one of the things I realized is that when you do things like that, when you do experiences like that as a group of internationals, then when, when Dwayne messes up, it becomes a funny story. Like we can actually laugh about it together. 
Um, but I realize sometimes individually, when you actually do something like that and, and you have a mess up or you have a setback, um, it's harder to actually employ your sense of humor. Um, so as you make friends who are also internationals, um, feel free to employ your sense of humor um, because we are all in one way or another trying to adjust to the culture, um, to the norms, um, to what should happen. Um, do not borrow stress from the future. So do not think to yourself, what is going to happen in fall quarter if this is what summer quarter is? Or don't think to yourself like, am I able to do this or whatever? Deal with stress that is present. Do not imagine stress in the future, pull it to the present and then stress about it. That's not helpful. All right, so deal with stress as it arises. Um, exercise and eat healthy foods. We are in America, there is a ton of really fast, quick, you know, Wendy's, Burger King, Five Guys. Those are great foods, but have those in moderation. Um, eat healthy foods, eat exercise. How you feel physically will also affect how you feel mentally. It will also affect your mood and your ability to, to push through in certain situations. Um, remember your family. Remember the ones who actually sent you here and are supporting you as you actually go through. So keep photos. If you can find food from home, if you can make food from home, um, make some food that just reminds you. And the smell of home is something that Kelsey will talk about a little bit, but the smell of home is so invigorated. Um, so, and then make time to connect with your family and friends um, and then ask help for, for it when you need it. So we at the TLC will support you as MSBA students, as international students, as students taking any math classes or writing anything, whether you're writing a paper or a resume or you're applying for a scholarship or a job, we are here to support you. There's a lot more support than just the TLC at our campus. So ask for help when you need it. Um, and at the same time, challenge yourself. These are not contrasting statements. Um, challenging yourself is saying like, how far can I go? Uh, how much can I put in and how much can I get out? Um, it's up to you to use your judgment to know sort of at what point you do need help and just know that when you do need help, um, we are here for you. So I'm gonna transition us into the teaching and learning portion of our talk and I'm gonna switch over to Kelvin and drink water for a bit. Okay, everybody. Um, same, same. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Teaching and Learning Center, um, and our. We should probably update our pictures, huh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, for a lot of different reasons, um, location and station in life. Um, so. Uh, the Teaching and Learning Center is really we're two we're teaching and learning centers because we are not just in one location. One is, well, if you could see out the window. <laughs> um, um, the quantitative center is. <laughs> it's all right. Yes. This. The Snoqualmie Library Building um, uh, and uh, the Quantitative Center is on the second floor um, up by the fancy chandelier. Um, and then uh, the Writing Center, which also uh, is the place for the uh, peer mentors is on the second floor of the Tioga Library Building. And they're connected by a sky bridge, which is fun to walk across. Um, okay, and uh, my name is Kelvin, and I am the English learner specialist in the uh, Teaching and Learning Center. But I'm also um, I'm also a writing tutor. Uh, and move this thing. Okay, so um, I'll talk specifically first about the writing center, and uh, I'll just say that we can help you with any part of your writing, except the typing part, you have to do the writing, actual writing of the paper, but anything else, we're happy to help you with talking about um, ideas, understanding the instructions. Um, and sometimes we don't understand the instructions and you have to go to your professor to find out more, but we're usually very good at interpreting what your professor wants. If you're having a hard time with that, we're happy to help you um, 
work through an outline if you need help getting started on the paper. Uh, we will read your draft with you either in person or we can read it um, just the text and give you uh, written feedback that way. Um, and you can also work with us over Zoom. Um, so I'm also happy to help you with um, any questions you might have about about English. That is the only thing that I do, but when it does come up, I'm always happy to do that. Um, I'm not here to um, uh, talk only about grammar, but if you do ever have a question about it, I'm always happy to help you with that. Um, and um, I think one reason why it's important to know that I'm here for that is because many times native speakers don't know their language as well as they think they do, right? I'm sure you have experienced this. Uh, you have a question for somebody and they can't explain to you and they'll just say, well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> and even if that is true, it isn't really helpful for learning about, well, what do I do? Um, so uh, that's what I'm here for. Um, also, always uh, citations. Uh, we can always help with those too. Okay. And uh, Dwayne, do you want to talk about quant? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, let me just come side by you. Yeah, sure. So write in any pages, any words, even your poetry. Quant side, your numbers. So you in particular will actually see a lot of statistics in your courses. You might also have to do a little bit of programming. Um, so the quant picture that you see right there shows you all the subjects that we can support. Um, so we are drop-in primarily. And then we have some online hours. So find us. We will help you with your statistics or with your programming. Um, we are open during the summer. So you can actually start finding us right now. Started not tomorrow. We're not open on Saturdays, but you can start finding us on Tuesday of next week. Monday's a holiday. Um, and then in between is the peer success mentors, which are not open during the summer. But if you actually want to work on things like how am I managing my time or what's my reading strategy or my test taking strategy? If you feel like you want some help on that, um, you can actually make an appointment with the TLC to work on that kind of stuff, stuff as well. So, okay. You can skip that today, actually. Okay. Yeah. That's a video of the peer success method. Oh, oh now we're to libraries. Yes. Are you okay. talking about libraries? Um, can you tell our summer hours for the TLC? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, the TLC will be, um, oh, is it the same for quant too? Yeah. We'll okay. Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> Monday through Thursday, uh, 10 to 5 in person. And then Fridays, we're all entirely online. Uh, but we do also have some uh, uh, evening hours and weekend hours for uh, writing appointments. Um, that are either uh, written feedback where you upload your document and then someone reads it and gives you written feedback or um, uh, or zoom. Um, so those are those are your options there. So it's actually it's a lot um, um, of help that we offer. Um, and I just hope that you um, that you use it and take advantage of it. We have, I think, one of the best um, writing centers in the country, I think. So we have a lot of really good training for, for our consultants and we have um, professional staff available too. So um, definitely use it. Um, there are a lot of tutoring services that you will find on the internet that you have to pay for. You have already paid for this one. So please use it. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, um, should I check the chat at this point? Because I'm about to switch hats and I'm going to become a librarian for a second. Should I check? I'll check it up for you. Okay, cool. All right, so I have a boast. So we have a host daughter who's from Japan and she had a research paper to write for, she's at Tacoma Community College, which is a wonderful institution. And so she went to her library and she wanted to find a article, a few articles, she needed at least four or five for her research paper on the relationship between Native American people and the bison. And she found one article. 
And so she was like, oh man, I, I guess I have to change my topic. And then I thought, never, never fear. I am connected to the UW library system. I will make this search for you, daughter. And so I actually went and searched and we found 400 books and articles and reports on that same topic. Whereas at her library, she only found one. That is the library that you're at right now. So the UW library, we have two library buildings here. Feel free to use them, great places to study. It's a Snoqualmie building and then you, dig deeper into the Snoqualmie building and you end up in a whole new building called the TLB building. Both are your library buildings, but those are connected to 19 libraries on the Seattle campus, a couple of libraries on the Bothell campus, and then they're connected to a number of libraries up and down the Pacific Northwest. So if there's anything that you need, anything that you need for your research or for any work that you're doing, we can get it. That is almost a guarantee almost a guarantee, 99.9% .9 of the time you can get it. Now you might be up late at night and you're actually found an article and it's maybe, maybe you use Google Scholar or something and they say like, hey, you know, pay you know, $2.99 for this article or $19.99 for that article, stop. Do not pay for that article. Our library can get it for you for free. So if you find an article and, and somebody's saying like, you should pay this, connect to our library. You can connect to our library 24 seven and ask, can, can this article be found for me um, for free? Um, one thing I will say though, if you do have a research assignment or a project, um, give yourself some time because there are some articles that we will scan for you and get for you, but that might take a couple of days. Or if it turns out that that article is in a library, say in London um, or a book that you want from London, it will take a little bit for us to get that book or get that thing to you. So give yourself a little bit of time if you have a research. Um, so that is my boast. You are connected to the UW library system. We have a ton of online resources, databases, eBooks, um, online help 24 seven. If you look at the library webpage, you'll see a chat. So any hour that, you're, that you are awake, there is also a librarian that's awake. Now, if you do the 24 seven chat at 3 a.m., you might not be getting one of our librarians. You might be getting a librarian who is in 3 a.m. Well, which country would be awake at 3 a.m.? Maybe London, like in, in England somewhere, like, yeah, or Australia. Yeah, so you may be getting an Australian librarian, but they will understand our library system, and so they'll be able to help you. Um, so definitely use our library website, but also if you need technology. So at our library, at this first building, you can borrow laptops. At our library, you can borrow calculators. You can bar borrow Raspberry Pis. I don't see that on our talk anymore. Um, do you guys know what a Raspberry Pi is? Okay, so first of all, the first Raspberry Pi that you're thinking about is awesome and delicious. But the Raspberry Pi we're talking about is a small computer that you can use to program um, and just do the testing. I think computer science students in particular will, will play around with those. So you can also borrow those unless that has changed. Um, and then what else do I wanna tell you about our library? Um, the library hours in the fall will be a little bit longer. So the library is hoping to be open till eight um, each day in the fall. Um, and then at some point in time, keep your fingers crossed, the library is going to be open on weekends. Um, I don't think that'll be exactly in the fall, but before the pandemic, our hours extended through Saturday and Sunday. Um, and so great place to study, great place to do research, great place to meet as a group, say like, hey, let's meet at the library and work on this project together. Um, why is it good to meet as a group in the library? The library has a number of group project rooms. Um, the room would be maybe about a third of this room size, has a huge table and then a huge computer screen. So all of you can actually work on the computer together, discuss stuff, there's a whiteboard. So good group project and study rooms. Um, just a good library to use. Like if you are connected to a school with a world-class library, um, it, would be, it would be sad to not make good use of it. Um, and I think, Oh, last thing that I want to highlight. So these are our hours during the summer. One small correction, the Monday through Thursday is 8.30 to 5 p.m. and the Friday is 8.30 to 4. Um, there's a research help desk that's on the first floor of the TLB library. Um, and they can actually give you consultation on a research project. Um, when my host daughter had a project, she consulted me and I'm not a librarian and I still found 400 articles. When you, consult, when you consult a research librarian, they will find tons of articles, 
but they'll also help you pare it down because you don't want to read 400 articles. At least I don't want to read 400 articles. I mean, maybe you do. Um, and so work with a research librarian. You can also make appointments online. You can contact the library online. Um, and I think that's everything that I want to tell you about the library. Does anybody have library questions that I might not be able to answer, but I will try. Questions in five. Oh, perfect. Oh, I think for the My Educator platform, if it's for a specific class, then you, you will probably have to buy it. But you actually bring up a good point. Um, for your textbooks, for your textbooks for any classes that you take at UWT, the library should have copies of that textbook. So what you're talking about is an online textbook resource. So that, that you won't find at the library. But if you have a textbook and you look at the cost of the textbook and you're like, this is a... 300 more dollars than I want to spend, check with the library if that textbook is available for you to actually borrow. Um, also, if you check with the library and they say they don't have the textbook, tell them the name of your course and the cost of the textbook and see if they will purchase that textbook to put on reserve in the library for your class. Um, so the library is actually making a, a concerted effort to save our save textbook costs because that's really a limiting cost for a lot of students. Textbooks are getting more and more expensive. So the library is trying to make sure that students don't have to buy textbooks if they can't afford it. Um, so yeah, good question. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna step down from the platform. Um, I'm gonna hang around for a bit because I heard that there's gonna be pizza. So you can ask me more questions later on um, about the TLC or the library. And if I don't know, then I'll actually be able to find out the information for you. Okay, we're going to get started again if everyone's ready. And I'm going to just continue to put your messages in the chat and Niaz, you can try to respond to them. And if you don't know, I'll check the messages again at the next break. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go into the next part of our presentation. It's cultural awareness and humility. I'm going to remove this. Okay, so since you all are in a new culture, we're going to spend some time talking about culture. Um, I'm really just going to present like a framework for understanding culture so then you have a framework to refer back to when you're adjusting. Okay, so we're going to start with an example, or I guess this is kind of an activity. And you'll see kind of a strange question up here. What does home smell like to you? Um, I'll use an example. So I just moved to UW Tacoma a couple years ago now. And if you have not experienced this already, you will soon, and you'll remember this moment. Tacoma has a certain smell and it's referred to lovingly as the Tacoma aroma. Um, so if people were to describe the smell, they would say it's a bad smell, um, kind of like rotten eggs or like sulfur, like gas and rotten eggs and garbage kind of like that's, that's, the, that's the overall Tacoma aroma. And you smell it on certain days. Yeah, it, it comes in like in certain wind patterns. You just smell it one day and you're like, oh, there it is. Um, and so I... I now have lived in Tacoma for a while and I've visited other cities that actually have a similar smell. And so actually when I smell this, I think, oh, it smells like home. <laughs> and now I've come to love the Tacoma aroma. Well, I don't love it, but I appreciate it a little bit more. And it kind of, I don't know, makes me feel like I'm home. So that's my example. I would like you to take a moment to reflect and then in your small group I want you to give an example of what home smells like to you. Um, so you can do that in your small groups and the three of us will join you and we can all chat. All right. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and keep going. So does anyone want to share 
a smell from home? <laughs> or did anyone hear something really interesting? We talked a lot about food. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yep. My group talked a lot about food too. Um, actually, uh, Dana from Kazakhstan said they have apples from Kazakhstan and we have apples in Washington as a like as a product, you know, that they there's orchards out here, um, not in this part, but on the east side. So we had that in common. And I didn't know that there were also a lot of apples produced in Kazakhstan. So learned something new. And horse meat. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, anyone else want to share? Okay, <laughs> no problem. Um, so the reason I asked this question is because often smells are very culturally related. Um, so for example, Tacoma, that Tacoma aroma that I described is, it's kind of a regional smell. It's because of it's an industrial city, you know, we have a mill here, it's an industrial city, it's situated by the bay. And so these things that are unique to Tacoma give it a smell. But if I were to ask someone else from this area, what reminds them of home, they might describe something like a home cooked meal or maybe a laundry detergent they use or something else completely different than the Tacoma aroma. If I were to just ask them this question. Um, now then, if I mention the Tacoma aroma, they might say, oh yeah, I've smelled that too, right? Um, but it's not often the first thing that comes to mind is the same. Um, I think in my group, there were three people from the same city, but they listed so many different things that kept coming to mind and they're all from the same city. Um, so this is to kind of just begin to start showing how complex the notion of culture is. And while there is a group understanding of culture, there are elements of culture that can feel very personal and very individual as well. And your understanding of your own culture might be different from someone who is perceived from the same culture. Um, so there's both. We're always walking that line between our, our personal identities of culture and our group identities and culture. So, um, yeah. The one thing I want you to take away from this activity is just that there is no correct way to understand culture. It's complex. Um, I'm gonna minus this. And then building on this idea, I have this image of lily pads. Um, if we look at the lily pads out on a pond, you might notice certain things about them. Their color, their shape, maybe their smell. Um, all of these surface level things that you can see from your vantage point. So if we compare culture to this image of lily pads, we might notice certain things about someone else's culture when we're visiting a new country. We might notice a new language, new food, new smells, new music, new clothes, all of those things that you can really experience with your senses and are quite obvious when you go to a different country, right? Any other examples of like obvious differences in culture that you guys can think of? I named quite a few, no pressure. All right, let's go deeper. Um, okay, so underneath the lily pads, there are all sorts of complex root systems. And you can see, you know, the lily pads only this big, right? But underneath, look how long the roots are and look how they're all interconnected. And there's all of these microorganisms and different things living in the roots and all of these different elements interacting. Um, we'll look at these of the as the elements that we can't see on the surface of culture, right? Most of culture is happening underneath the surface. So these are things like, timeliness. I know Dwayne mentioned earlier about um, getting somewhere on time. Is it like a non-visual element of culture? How we approach a task, how we approach group work, um, how we introduce ourselves, how we communicate. It's all of these different elements that are much harder to see, right? Um, so with that in mind, any ideas of some of these more invisible elements of culture? Complex of beauty. Oh yeah, definitely, yes. Um, Dwayne said concepts of beauty. That's a very good example. That's, that's very different culture to culture. Um, and then another one, well, I was thinking, you know, 
within cultures, you kind of get into the element of subcultures as well, right? So your age can put you in a different culture, um, your religion, your racial background, your socioeconomic status. These are identity aspects, but they're also cultural groups. And so we belong to multiple cultures at the same time. And that's also why culture becomes more and more complex because I'm an American. Um, I'm also a millennial. I'm a white woman. I'm belonging to all these different cultural groups at the same time. Um, and so that's why when someone asks me about culture, I might not just be talking about national culture. Um, I'm perceiving all of my identities through this lens of culture. Um, so, so that's more of the invisible level stuff, right? Some of it's visible, some of it's not. The notion is it's big and complex and kind of endless. <laughs> so one more little activity. Why is it important to understand this big complex notion of culture? So we're gonna watch a video by Chimimanda Ngozi Adichie. She's a Nigerian American writer. Um, she also does a lot of TED Talks and this one is a great one. It's called The Danger of a Single Story. We're only gonna watch a short snip, but I recommend you watch the whole thing. Um, it's really good. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new house boy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa, and other countries. <laughs> so after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, 
had seen Fide's family. Okay, so maybe you got a chance to see some of the questions here on the screen as well. Um, as kind of our last piece of this presentation, I want us to take some time to answer these questions in our small group as a conversation, and then we'll come back and talk about um, a framework, okay? Okay, welcome back. Okay, we're gonna wrap this section up. Um, so we've been having a lot of discussions about the complexity of culture and those layers of culture and belonging to different cultures. Um, and so I wanna introduce this framework and without getting too theoretical, um, there is a framework called cultural humility, which was coined by, and I wanna get their names right. It was coined by Melanie Turvalon and Jan Murray Garcia, who worked in the healthcare field because they thought that the common approach at the time, which was cultural competence, was actually quite limiting in their field of healthcare. They thought there wasn't enough education about multiculturalism and cultural competence wasn't meeting that need. The reason being is if we look at culture as something we can gain competence in or mastery in, then we kind of stop learning, right? We think like, okay, I'm done. I got an A on culture. I'm done listening. I'm done caring. I got it, right? And so the idea of cultural humility is to approach culture through a lens of curiosity and gracefulness and patience. So, you know, engaging with cultural in this understanding that we're never going to master it, right? That we're never going to know everything about it. We're never going to know everything about someone else's culture, even if we're from the same culture. We're never going to know everything about our culture because we're going to keep learning and keep changing, which puts us in different cultures, which is all, you know, very multi-layered. And so my ask of you all is to approach culture with this humility. You're in a new culture. Try not to master it. If you try to master it, you're going to get frustrated and it might even make you miss home more. You just approach it with curiosity and active listening, you know, ask people about their culture, talk about your culture, um, and it will make you feel, I think, quite a bit better about the adjustment process. All right. Um, yes, okay, so that's my last slide about cultural humility. Any questions before we take a five minute break? Okay, so Akane is going to talk about UW Tacoma campus resources, and this is the last part of the presentation. And then we'll this will be like ten to twenty minutes. Yeah, Pizza's already here, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so super quick, I want to go over some campus resources. So pantry, we have this um, campus resource called the pantry because we don't want students to go hungry or have issue buying hygiene products themselves. So it's a free service offered to everybody. Once per week, you can grab up to 20 items from pantry and you can go into Dugan 104 and um, grab stuff in person. So yeah, feel free to check out this venue. I, I think I have never been, but I, they have it very well stocked. So make sure you check it out. Um, Going to college can be very stressful and particularly at a graduate level, academic expectation can be very high. So that alone is stressful and who knows, you know, some things may happen to you, hopefully not nothing big, but it just can be super stressful. I remember I was also an international student myself and I went to undergraduate and graduate program here. And when I was a graduate student, it was the most stressful time of my life. And I had all these like health issues. Like I would bite so hard that my jar would like, my mouth would not open because I had it like, you know, I, I was so stressed out or, you know, it's just like stuff happens to your body too when you're too stressed out. So make sure you kind of um, learn about this like coping mechanism. So maybe if you don't have anything going on in your, in your life, it's still a good idea to um, take participate in one of their group counseling 
um, programs like understanding self and others, build your social confidence, healthy mind, mindfulness workshop. These are all great skills to have in your back pocket. So um, kind of think about taking care of your mental health as well as taking care of your body. Like Duane was talking earlier, don't eat too much junk food, you know. Um, think about taking care of your mental health as important as taking care of your health too. And they are very friendly people. I would su I suggest you all to check it out. Um, these are their, that's their office and they're in mattress factory and they're very friendly folks. And this is about international student health insurance. So if you are here at UW Tacoma with the F1 student visa, you will automatically enroll to this international student health insurance, except if you're MCL student, I think there's some MCL student in this group, because your program is a fee-based program, this insurance is not included in your tuition. So make sure if you want to have a coverage, make sure you sign up for it individually. So um, if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to us, but basically you need to email iShip office and let them know that you wanna enroll. Otherwise you are already enrolled. And if you want to waive it, because maybe you, you have a spouse who work for a US company and they have an insurance for you, then you can waive it too. But the deadline to waive is same as the tuition deadline. So make sure you waive too. And um, another tip is, you know, most of you are graduating in spring quarter, right? In next spring. And if you wish to continue with the insurance, you could purchase it till end of August, 2024. So when it comes time for you to purchase annual coverage, uh, go ahead and purchase annual coverage and it doesn't end in June, it will be extended to end of August. So that's a tip for your um, final, or this fall you can purchase it annually or you at the latest you can buy it at the time of spring registration and it will last till end of um, August. But if you don't buy, if you just buy quarterly insurance and you have only purchased quarter, quarterly insurance for summer, I mean spring, it, it will end on in June. So you wanna be careful about that. Okay. And we have a great resource on campus called Career Development and Education. And I know, um, after you finish your graduate program here, I, I know it's very important for you to also obtain some skill um, work, work experience in the US. So take advantage of their, their go to their website, um, look at their program offering and um, learn about what services that they, can, they offer to students and you can use their service even after their, you graduate as an alum. So they usually offer um, like career fairs and I don't think that um, schedule was updated on their website yet, but you can check with check in to their website and then find out when their um, career fairs are. Okay. And this is our office. We are, our office is called International Student and Scholar Services. We're part of larger office called Office of Global Affairs. And there's Kelsey and me. Kelsey advised students with last name A through L, and I advise student last name M through Z. And Cameron is a person who um, goes through the emails first, and then also he, they manages the student staff who work in the front of our office in GWP 102. So the best way to get a hold of us is by email. So this is, it's better to email to the office email rather than our personal email because even if one of us is out, um, somebody is checking that email 
few times a day. So, and we have, we can, we also offer individual appointments. So you have access to our calendar to book time if you want to talk to us in person or um, Zoom. And we also have drop-in hours twice a week. And that's a hybrid one. So you can come in person or come, come in Zoom. And these are social media that we use. Please add as a friend, as our friend. And there's Discord server for our office. So you're welcome to join the conversation there. And we will have trips during fall and the kayaking has already ended. Yeah, so we have more um, fun activity planned during fall quarter. So please join. These are a list of activities that we had last year. And if you have any suggestion of what to do for our trip, please let us know we go somewhere fun or do something together once a month. And it's a great way to meet other students too. And every, every week we send newsletter during fall, winter and spring quarter. So there are some information on, on there, please take a look. And from autumn quarter again, we will have tea time every week. So every once a, we haven't decided what day of the week, but we will meet in, um, in um, Snoqualmie Hall and we will have lots of snack. And once a month we will open this snack box and it has like a mystery country and all of the snack are from that country. It's really, really fun. So please come to that. And um, I know a lot of you are very curious to learn more about optional practicum training and curricular practicum training opportunities. We can't cover it during orientation because the topic is too long, but we are going to have workshop on those dates. So um, they're on Zoom, so please join. And we also record them. So if you miss it, you can ask for the recording of it. These are some reminders. So I think many of you are already registered. Make sure you register 10 credit if you're a grad student each quarter. Um, complete the CBUS activation form, which I think many of you have done with that. This one, you upload your I-94 and upload a copy of your visa so we can make sure all the documents looks correct. And um, let's see, yeah. So if you're transfer students, which means you have transferred your CBUS record from a different school, will give you a different kind of I-20 within the next 30 days. So we'll email you when that's ready. And then because we cannot cover everything during our short orientation today, please make sure to complete the new international student info session. And if you haven't gotten a Husky card, you can order it online. And the Husky card is very important to have because sometimes building is locked but if you have the card, you can use it to unlock. And also um, that is used for your um, ORCA card to take the bus. But if you're an MCL student, you, it's not part of your um, tuition. So you have to purchase it yourself because you're a fee-based program. 